Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Schwartz. I'm the executive director of ASEP, and I am with one of our keynote faculty at, at our upcoming conference, Dr. Ron Siegel. Ron is a psychologist on the faculty of Harvard, and he is also author of The Mindfulness Solution. Hi, Ron. Hi. So uh, I want we we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, in mindfulness and how obviously a lot of people want to teach uh, clients how to be more mindful, but also uh, mindfulness can be a very useful tool for helping therapists uh, become uh, more more present. And I thought we might give people a, a an interesting tidbit about that today. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the more uh, profound ways that mindfulness practice can uh, support psychotherapy. And it allows us to be more present through a few different mechanisms. First, simply by practicing mindfulness ourselves, and here I'm talking about formal meditation where we uh, sit and follow the breath or some object, some other object of attention, and each time our mind wanders away, we bring it back to that object of attention. Well, that obviously trains our capacity for concentration, our capacity to remain focused, so it makes it easier to focus in the session. But it goes beyond that. Because if we think about what distracts us in sessions, what makes it hard to stay focused, it almost always has to do with some kind of pain, either some concern we've got, some anxiety that's bringing our attention away, some pain that's coming up in the session right now, which is difficult to be with. After all, most of our clients are patients. They don't come in just to tell us about graduations and weddings and, and winning the lottery. They tell us about painful events that happen, and it can be difficult to sit with this. So one of the other ways that mindfulness practice helps is that when we're sitting in our formal practice and some kind of discomfort comes up, whether it be an itch or an ache or, uh, or something else which is difficult, we practice turning the attention to that difficulty and simply being with it and noticing how it changes in and of itself. And once we've practiced that often enough with these physical events, well, then when emotional events come up in therapy sessions, we're that much better equipped to ride those waves as well. We develop stronger affect tolerance. And the other way, there, there's a couple other ways that it helps us develop the affect tolerance too. One is that mindfulness practice, when we, when we spend a lot of time allowing thoughts to arise and pass, arise and pass, we tend to take our thinking a little bit less seriously. We tend to identify with it less. So that if, for example, if somebody, let's say a friend of mine has done me dirty, and I'm thinking, I can't believe you did that to me after all I've done for you, and I'm rehearsing that over and over and thinking about my good deeds and his bad deeds. <laughs> Each time right. I go through that loop, right, sure. I'm going to have another rush of anger. It's going to arise in the body, and it's going to get reinforced by this constant cognition. But what happens in mindfulness practice is we learn to simply stay with the body events Let's say in this case the body events of anger, so I might feel oh, tightness in the chest and heart rate picking up and shoulders getting tight and noticing the thoughts happening and perhaps images of decapitating former friend passing through the sky, the, the, uh, the sky of the mind, if you mm -hmm. will. But all of this starts to feel impersonal. It starts to feel like moment-to-moment -moment organismic events rather than my anger, which is so important because I'm right and he's wrong. And there's something about seeing these events as impersonal that helps them not to have the same amount of power. And that, too, winds up increasing our affect tolerance, our ability to be with difficult feelings. And there's even a third mechanism. There's even a way in which simply by taking thoughts lightly and seeing thoughts coming and going as clouds in the sky, their content grips us somewhat less. And I, I've got to find out how they've done the study, but I recently heard that there was a cognitive science study showing how long an affect or feeling lasts in the, absent of, the absence of the thought. And the answer was about 90 seconds. And I don't know how they studied that, but it rings true intuitively that feelings hmm. come as these kind of mind-body events, and then they pass unless they're reinforced by the thought. And what happens with mindfulness practice is we don't get as caught in the thought, so the emotions can course through us. And we don't stop the emotions, but it's like we learn to surf them. And I think all of these things together allow us to actually show up in the room more for our clients or our patients. And, you know, we don't have firm evidence for this, but it seems likely that therapy would go better if two people were in the room together. So I'm, if we were to, I'm wondering if you, for the people listening, if there was one specific actionable thought or, or, or action, which is an internal or 
that a, that a, a therapist listening could do to take these ideas that you've just said and now use it? Any 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 suggestions that would be a real take home for them? Sure, I think when sitting with a client, to simply check in over and over to some non-cognitive object of awareness, say the breath in the body, other sensations in the body, the feeling of sitting, just listening to the client, but something other than our thought stream. So as just to ground ourselves over and over in the present moment in this way, and particularly in what's happening in the body in the here and now, as a way to be able to be with whatever affects are coming up. Because if therapy is going well, there's a lot of feeling in the room. All right. Well, that's, that's, that's great. So um, hopefully that uh, uh, has been helpful for folks. We don't want to keep you too long. And um, um, Ron's going to be doing a keynote at the conference. And uh, we hope to uh, see you there. He's going to have a lot more uh, important things to say. Thanks a lot, Ron. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to seeing you and everybody else at the conference. All right, great.